everybody has been vaccinated, these, these masks are like Velcro suspenders. But every one of you here has a pair of waders, and we know those are Velcro suspenders. <laughs> and that's not why I'm wearing this. I bought three of these really nice masks with trout and everything on at the beginning of the year, and I'm going to get my money's worth. <laughs> trying to sell you a $10,000 trip to Argentina, or maybe just a $350 float down the Colorado River. Maybe just a beer. Yeah, or a beer. Yeah. <laughs> to, tonight you're going to get away really, really kind of cheap, because we've got two books for sale here tonight. The uh, Fly Fishing uh, Guide here to uh, Colorado's Backcountry, which is really a how-to book. It contains strategies for high lakes and small streams. And about 50% of the information here is applicable to fishing for trout anywhere in the world, actually. The other uh, book over here is my more recent one, and it's a fishing guide to 800 high lakes in Colorado. So there's trail descriptions in there, how to get to the trailheads, topographical maps, and what you can expect as far as species of trout when, when you get up there. So I've got two groups of friends. Most of them fall in the category that says, I can't wait until you publish that book. Oh, you finally got it out. That's really great. And then I've got the other group of friends that say, why did you publish that book? And give away all the information. Well, you know, none of us are going to live forever. And, you know, I've looked at the actuarial table, so I know that. So I, I just want to read a little bit out of my foreword. Really, I want anglers to learn about these high lakes so they'll appreciate them more. And only by appreciating these public lands will, pe will people be willing to protect them. Protect them from abuse by other recreationists, and more importantly, protect them from others who may want to abuse abusively exploit them for financial gain. Now, you might think that many of these lakes are in wilderness, and really that is true. However, wilderness is not necessarily forever. Only Congress can create wilderness areas, but Congress can also de-designate wilderness areas or compromise their nature by allowing motorized entry or uses that are not compatible with their wilderness nature. Those of Colorado's high lakes that are not in wilderness areas are mostly with, within national forests. These lands have less protection, but the areas surrounding the high lakes are generally managed for recreation. However, the priority of uses does not require congressional a action, and it can be changed through agency action. Uh, furthermore, most of Colorado's high lakes and reservoirs hold trout populations only because Colorado Parks and Wildlife has a long history of actively stocking them, and we can't take that for granted, especially during times of uh, tight budgets here. So, you know, I do have books here available tonight. Uh, you can also get them on my website, which has a link to my printer, which is a book page, and they'll actually ship you a book. So first we're going to start with a five-minute review of how to fish high lakes. And if you want a little bit uh, more on this, obviously you can buy my first book, but you can also look at December 
17 minute presentation that I have that's in YouTube. Just Google Ron Belak in YouTube and I've got, a, I don't know, three or four of them up there and you'll find the one on high lakes. I like to compare lakes with rivers and streams because we all have that framework of fishing rivers and streams and we're very familiar with them. With rivers and streams, the water isn't moving and the fish are, are predominantly stationary, at least on a daily or weekly basis. It's really easy to locate holding water, even by people that have been fly fishing only for maybe a year or two. However, in lakes, the water is stationary and the fish are moving, and they're moving about on a daily basis and, and also a seasonal basis. So to the novice, the entire lake really looks like it's holding water, and it can be very difficult to locate fish. So really, the understanding of movement of trout in high lakes is really the key to successfully fishing them. And trout and high lakes move in response to several variables, of which water temperature is probably the most important. And water temperature is a function of the season of the year. And it's also a function of elevation. Generally, the higher up you go, the colder the average water temperatures. Now, Parks and Wildlife realized this decades ago. And they developed this classification system for high lakes based on elevation, low, middle, and high elevation lakes. The low elevation lakes are below about 10,000, 10,200 feet. They're fed by permanent streams coming into the lakes. They have streams flowing out. They have relatively warm water temperatures during the summer. You go up there in midsummer, oftentimes the water temperature exceeds 65 degrees. Well, this is outside the comfort range of trout. So what are they going to do? They're going to retreat into the cooler, deeper centers. If you hike up there with a fly rod and you're fishing from shore, you're probably not going to be too successful unless you brought in a belly boat. On the opposite end of the extreme, we have the high elevation lakes. And they're located principally in certs. They're fed by snowmelt and groundwater. And they have relatively cold water temperatures. You go up there in midsummer, a lot of times the water temperature doesn't even hit 60 degrees. So this is well within the comfort range of trout. So as long as there is open water on those lakes, you're going to have some trout that are going to cruise shore looking for food. And then in between, we have the middle elevation lakes below, between about Timberline and about 10,000 feet. And there's a combination of different characteristics at the middle elevation lakes. So I like to use this matrix over there here to show you how I go about fishing through the course of the year. I start out with that red X fishing uh, spring ice out at the lower elevation lakes. That's the only game in town because they're the only ones that are open yet. And I will follow ice out to progressively higher elevation as those lakes ice out. And I'll stay at those middle elevation lakes fishing the summer hatches and then eventually move up onto the tundra to fish the high elevation lakes, usually around mid-July, third week or so of July. And then come about mid-September, third week of September, I'll start moving down as the water starts to chill down, fishing those hatches at the middle elevation lakes and ending up down uh, on the lower elevation lakes, fishing ice out tactics in the autumn before the lakes ice up. So ice out strategies, uh, the main strategy is really to use a full sinking line and not a sinking tip. You know, a, a type five or six that sinks at about five or six inches per second and to fish these down towards the bottom where the fish are. They'll be coming in, cruising shore, looking for food. I like to use things like uh, black leeches, black woolly buggers, Royal Coachman streamers, white bunny leeches, and then a whole series of soft tackle and orange wet flies. And these are, you know, size, size eights down to 14 here. So we talked about how trout move about in response to water temperature. They also move around in response to insect hatches. And we know this because we see caddis along shore in the, in the willows a lot. However, those midges are always hatching farther out from shore, and that's mainly because the larvae like really fine-grained sediment. And that's where you find it. It's away from shore, away from the midges, and usually just beyond the length of your cast, also. 
So the summer strategy is really to match the hatch. In order to do that, you need to know a little bit about the entomology. Um, the thing you're going to be fishing the most are midges. So you got to get down to not quite the 26s, but you know, I fish down to like 22s or so. You'll be fishing mainly the pupa and the adult. You'll be fishing them as soon as the, as the uh, lakes ice out. They'll be present all the way up into fall until the lakes ice up and they're at all elevation. Caddisflies are also important. You don't get the blanket hatches on the high lakes like you do on the rivers, but they are large insects with a lot of calories. They got about 100 times the amount of calories of a midge. So obviously the, the fish are going to opportunistically take them. Mayflies, but they're different on the high lakes. You have calabatus mostly below timberline and then gray drakes up above, and the gray drakes are as big as the green drakes that you'll find like on the Arkansas, they're size, size 12s. Terrestrials in the middle of the season, ants, beetles, and small hoppers, leeches and scuds, particularly below timberline, although I've seen scuds all the way up to 12,000 feet. Okay, well that, that's about it on how to fish these lakes. Let's get to where we're gonna fish now. And the way the book is organized, there's six chapters in there, and there are 23 individual articles. Each article covers an individual mountain range that has trout in there, and I cover all the mountain ranges in Colorado that do have trout. So we're gonna, we're gonna run through five or six of these things pretty quickly, just to give you kind of an overview. And we're gonna start out in the, in the front range, and we're gonna talk about uh, those areas that are close to home, the Mount Evans Fall River and James Peak area. So that's everything north of Winola Pass that up to the southern border of the Indian Peaks Wilderness. So this area has over 50 high lakes and small reservoirs. And even though, you know, I'm talking about 800 high lakes, um, you know, these are not all butt busters to get in. There's about 200 lakes in the book that you can drive to with your Subaru. And there's probably about that many other lakes in here that have less than a two and a half mile one way hike to get into. So some of them are quite accessible. But in this area, there are over 50 high lakes and small reservoirs. Many are at or above timberline. We know the front range is steep, um, short but steep hikes, although some are accessible by four wheel drive. And you will be fishing uh, mainly from July to late September, that's the season. And this area is noted for some larger cutthroat trouts. And you do not need permits for camping in this area. So let's start out with the east portal of the Mosque of Tunnel. Uh, this is west of Rollinsville. I once had someone come up to me as I was putting on my backpack in the parking lot. And they said, can I drive through that? <laughs> and, and I told this person, I said, yes. But if you see a bright light coming at you, there's not enough room to pass. <laughs> so there's a number of trails out of the Mosca Tunnel there. Um, like I said, the seasonal cycle here in the front range goes from, oh, iced out in mid to late June. Um, the trout will, cutthroat will go into a spawn, and that lasts about two or three weeks. And even though they don't successfully spawn within the lakes, they will in the streams that feed the lakes but they don't spawn successfully in the lake. They're kind of hard to catch through the spawn. You know, they're only interested in one thing, and it's really not, not feeding. But after the spawn is over, they'll go, which is about, you know, the third week of July, they'll go in this extensive summer feeding cycle that lasts until about the second, third week of September, when the water temperature drops below about 45 degrees, the fish get a little lethargic. You can still catch them, but, but it, the action is pretty slow. So uh, one of the series of lakes up there are forest lakes. There, there's two forest lakes uh, to fish up there. Um, I give the elevations of all of these lakes here on the bottom and the one-way um, hiking distance to get there. You know, three miles doesn't sound like a lot, but it is pretty steep, you know, so don't, don't think that these are all really short hikes in there. For instance, the Maka Tunnel is about 9,200 feet, you know, so you're getting up there about 
the for the two forest lakes have brook trout in there mainly in the eight to twelve inch category or so there's quite a few fish good dry fly fishing another trail gets up the crater lakes up there and there are four crater lakes three of which have fish i think the the fourth one is is probably about a mud puddle right now it was about ten years ago when i when i was up there but anyways as you get up to the crater lakes there the one on the left which which this woman is fishing over here um basically you'll catch a brook trout on every other cast and they'll be you know six to nine inches or so it's overpopulated there are some splake also in that lake uh the one here the one here on the right this uh crater lake has brook trout and cutthroat in there in the 10 to 12 inch range or so with a few larger fish the one you really want to fish is the one you have to climb another half a mile and get up to that timber line and that has some really beefy cutthroat in there a lot harder to catch and they get up to about 15 or 16 inches so let's talk about the mount evans area and we'll talk about the area off the road i think you all know that you actually have to get a reservation to go in there through recreation.gov um they're they're fairly easy to get the permit in order to get up there and us geezers that have you know the old old person's card over there it only costs two bucks to get up there um the younger people have to pay 15 dollars i think so i i don't quite figure that out but that's okay as far as i'm concerned but if you start over there at at uh echo lake and and drive up there the first lake you're going to see down on the left side is lincoln lake and there is a thousand foot drop to get down to the lake you want to come down this way it's really steep and come at it from the uh, outlet end over here it really has mostly brook trout in there small boat trout but there are some small lake trout as well uh, this particular fish was not from lincoln lake i just put it in there to make sure that i told you about the uh, lakers there uh, you can drive right up to summit lake at 12,800 feet for just about everybody this will be the highest elevation that you'll catch a trout at unless you go to like ecuador or peru <laughs> you know um, i saw a trout at 13,000 feet in ecuador so and, and quite a few fish in the lakes there but you can drive right up to this um really doesn't ice out until kind of middle to, to late july so it's really an august type lake to get up there you'll see if you get up there too early you'll see the fish spawning kind of trying to spawn right at the outlet over there by the road so just just leave them alone and come back in another couple weeks you'll catch nice uh cutthroat up there i've caught fish up to 16 inches or so on dry flies and midges if you continue on that parking lot and just walk in the direction where everybody's going you can look down at chicago lakes you can actually access them there is a trail that goes down about a mile it drops 1400 feet there are two Chicago lakes they contain cutthroat trout the cutthroats actually spawn in this outlet so leave them alone over there in the stream fish the two lakes the upper lake is easier to fish because there is less willows around there and I've seen some real hogs in among these uh, boulders here near the outlet the road to St. Mary's Glacier you know we all see that when we're heading uh, eastbound on I-70 before we get to Idaho Spring well, there's a little lake up there called St. Mary's Lake, and uh, it's only like a half a mile to go in there. And this is about the most people I've ever seen fishing it at one time, three or four people. So you, you'll, you'll see a lot of people up there, but they're going up to St. Mary's Glacier up there. So this, this lake um, principally has brook trout in there, but also has tiger trout. The brookies only get up to about 10 inches or so. Most of them are like eight, nine inches. But these tiger trout get up to about 15 inches. And it's about the easiest place that you can get into to catch uh, tiger trout. There's also the St. Mary's Cliff Divers up there as well. And this woman over here, I would say, is actually on the bunny slope, getting ready to dive into the uh, lake. She did dive in there successfully. But these uh, two guys up here are up about 30 feet or so, and there he got he had the guts to go in there. And then this other guy is getting up the nerve over here to 
John, uh, come on, let's go. There you go. Oh, great, great rise form, by the way. <laughs> you don't have to worry about this particular area. You're going to have to fish that anyway, as you can see there's cliffs around it. But it, it's some entertaining if the fishing gets a little slow. <laughs> also off the, the road there to St. Mary's is the town of Alice, and you can snake through Alice. If you have a four-wheel drive vehicle, and I don't mean a Subaru, I mean something with considerable clearance on it, you can go up a really nasty cobble-filled road about two and a half miles to Loch Lomond, or you can hike the thing. Um, it's a big reservoir. It has brook trout and 12, up to 12, 13 inches, and lake trout in there, some larger lake trout. So you may see some people, you know, in belly boats or canoes or stuff that are trolling for lake, or you can see the, the, the dam over here. Where these people are, they, they've hiked up the trail here to get up above, and they're looking down at these lakes over here. Here's the, the reservoir we just talked about, then Oman, Stewart, and, and uh, Reynolds Lake over here, which have brook trout. But Stewart also has some lake trout. And I've seen a picture of at least one really nice laker that, that came out of there. It was over 20 inches. Also up in that area are, are Lake Carolyn um, and Ice Lake. These are, are cutthroat lakes. Carolyn and cutthroat vary from season to season, season based on how much water is let out of the lake, how much stocking, and how much fishing pressure. Sometimes you get a lot of small fish, other years you'll get some bigger fish, but less fish. Ice lake is more consistent, but you'll have icebergs floating in the lake and until August. That's why they call it ice lake, but I, I caught these nice 13-inch uh, uh, cutthroat in there, and they were really brilliant. All right, let's move on to Rocky Mountain National Park. Can you imagine? Some people write whole books on this. <laughs> they have self-sustaining populations there. The, the uh, trout reproduce in the streams and move freely in, in back and forth into the lakes. There is no or very little stocking up in Rocky Mountain National Park. Most lakes that are above timberline are barren. Uh, so you have to know which ones do have fish in there. Um, I compiled a list in the back that um, basically stole the list from Steve Schweitzer's <laughs> book. And, and also uh, Rocky Mountain National Park also used a circulating list of the barren lakes as well. Smaller trout on average in the park, a 12-incher is a good one, a 14-incher is a giant. It's primarily catch and release. There are just a couple of waters up there where they let children use bait, and there's, I don't know, two or three waters like that. And there's hordes of people on any side. You know, when you come out, I mean, I was coming out of Dream Lake once, and, and it was a September, Sunday afternoon in September, you know, and, and it was just brilliant, gorgeous. I counted 240 people on the trail coming out. And that was about 10 years ago. So that was a awful lot of people. Maybe with the permit system now to get in, it won't be as, as crowded. 240 people, but there were only four or five that had, had rocks. So Reservations are needed just to enter the park now, and you need a permit for any backcountry uh, camping in there, and they're a little difficult to get. I, I went in there last year into the Hutchinson Lakes, and uh, my friend got the permit. Some trails are closed due to fires in there, so you have to check with the park. So you can see some of the fire closure areas up here. There's Cameron Peak area up here, and this is from the East Troublesome Gulch Fire over here, which is north of Grand Lake and Granby. And there's the Forest Canyon Fire several years ago closed this area in here, too. So before you go there, uh, you want to check with the website for the park to see what's closed. If you go up there in September, you know, you'll see elk coming down today. I live in Evergreen. I saw about 80 elk about a mile and a half up from my house. It was kind of dark, though. You know? <laughs> I didn't see, see them really good. Uh, Sprague Lake, you can drive right up to it, and it's not very deep either. You can wade out most of the lake there. It has brook trout in there. Uh, the brook trout spawn in the uh, uh, September in brook. 
throat that goes away throat creek i believe is the is the creek that runs in the spread of the lake there are also some rainbows i've seen rainbows in the stream there and people report catching them in the lake itself uh... it's a photographer's paradise up there because you get really nice sunsets so you have a lot of people up there taking pictures and there's some moose that they train to go around the lake there to kind of spread out the people a little bit glacier gorge junction you know is probably one one of the most famous areas up there you can hike to dream lake it's only a mile i've never been up there where i haven't seen somebody fishing not a lot of people but maybe two three four people will be fishing up there there's cutthroat in in dream lake up to about twelve inches i would continue on the trail there like peggy's doing here and i would go to lake hiaha which is another mile mile and a half to there it's more difficult to fish because the lake is lined with these granitic boulders here and so it's hard to get down there but the fish come and they go in between the boulders and this has some of the larger fish in the park i've i've caught fish up to seventeen inches in there and it's pretty good dry fly fishing with caddis and and terrestrials in the in the later summer there's the one of the fish a little smaller fish there but um, these are yellowstone cutthroat actually the, the lock also very famous up there um, you will always see people up there fishing too it's very fertile a lot of bug life principally cutthroat up there but you do get some brook trout that come in from the lakes up above if you don't want to go to the lock you can take the fork in the trail you know whenever you come to a fork in the trail you want to take it and this one you want to take to the uh, to the right and go to mills lake and you go to mills lake um, you want to cross over to log jam and over these boulders here and fish this side among the spruce because there are a lot less people over there. Uh, Ninety percent of the people go around this side here, and you won't be able to get in the back pass without hitting anybody. <laughs> and, and you will catch mostly in there uh, cut bows in there and rainbow trout up to about 12 inches. Uh, Fern Lake and Odessa Lake, uh, both cutthroat waters, cutthroats up to about 12 inches. The trails going in there were really impacted by the fire up there, but I understand that vegetation around the lake is pretty much intact. And there's one with a cutthroat there. All right, go to the west side of the park if you want to get away from people. We'll talk about the North Inlet Trail. There are obviously less um, lakes on the west side. You can access the North Inlet Trail from the east end of Grand Lake. This is mainly backpacking here because the distances are a little longer. You'll get more moose over on the west side. Um, you can see that Lake Nokomi is a nine mile hike in. There's a designated uh, camping site, which is about a mile and a half below this. 30 years ago, there were some really nice cutthroat, large cutthroat in, in Lake Nokomi. But it's no longer stocked. It hasn't had any fish in probably for 20 years or so. So just take a picture like this, go buy it. And another mile to Lake Nanita. Lake Nanita has pure strain Colorado River cutthroat in there up to about 13 inches. Parks and Wildlife collects the spawn during the spring and they take the spawn to the hatcheries and they, they raise the trout there and they use these trout to, to stock a lot of other high lakes, including Trapper's Lake when Trapper's has done some additional stocking. The lake is closed uh, during the spawn, so you want to check the Parks and Wildlife regulations so that you don't hike 10 miles to get up there and then find out you can't fish. You say, Ron Belak never told me that. Well, I'm telling you that now, so please remember. Um, the inlet stream is, is closed all the time, but I, I can't remember exactly when the, the lake opens. It might be like July 15th or so, but check the regs on that. Um, here's one of the cutthroat there. Okay, let's move on to the Grand Mason. Here's where you can use your automobile, or your RV, or whatever you have here, because most of the lakes are really accessible by motor vehicles. Uh, Grand Mesa is a flat top volcanic mesa of about 800 square miles. So it's kind of like a little mini flat top, you know, over there to the south. 
there are 300 small and mid-sized reservoirs up there, but only 100 of them are stocked with trout. So um, you need to find out which 100. And the only place that I know where you can find out right now is in my book. <laughs> now, Parks and Wildlife had published a special publication on the Grand Mesa about 30 years ago, but it's been out of circulation for at least 15 years. Most waters are, are motor vehicle accessible, so it's a great place to go if, you know, uh, you know, maybe you sprained your ankle or something, can't walk very much, or, or just feeling lazy. Um, mostly catchable rainbows up there. Some special regulation waters are for cutthroat trout, and, and these are my favorite up there. And we'll, we'll cover a few of these. And there are zillions upon zillions of mosquitoes <laughs> up there. Just, I mean, they'll, they'll drive you absolutely all right, this is a map of the Grand Mesa. Um, those of us that live on the East Slope here will probably be coming I-70, and then you'll take off on the historic byway, and it's, and it's paved, you know, up to about this point. It's just, uh, there's Grand Junction here, the Delta down in the south. Why do they have these reservoirs? Well, it's municipal water, really, for Grand Junction, and it's also used to irrigate things like the Lake of Sweet Corn, Peaches, we all love those, but my favorite is the Cabernet Sauvignon. <laughs> so you get this really interesting signage up there on the Mesa. Now, you know, they're, they're telling you that this lake doesn't have any fish in it, but this is the only lake that I know of up there on the Grand Mesa that actually has a sign that doesn't tell you that there are any fish in there. So there are 199 other ones. So here's a map, um, if you're coming in there from you know, Denver Front Range, and you come in and you follow the pavement all the way up to the Mesa Lakes area, um, the first little pond that you'll come to, Jumbo Reservoir, is filled with catchable rainbows, and you'll find people you know, drowning power bay and stuff in there. What you want to do is you want to go to the Mesa Lakes over here. This is a day use area. You know, I think it costs five bucks to get in there or so for the day. There's also a campground there as well. But you can get away from the people just by walking along Mesa Lake over there. And Mesa Lake is, is actually quite pretty. And it's a good place to belly boat or to fish from shore. You can get away from people there. And you'll catch mostly brook trout and some rainbow trout up to about 12 inches. Um, also right adjacent to that is Sunset that lives up to its reputation because it has really good mid-catches just as the sun sets. And you'll catch mostly uh, rainbow trout in there, mostly catchable rainbows, but you'll have a good time. If you want to do a little hiking, you can go around the shore of, of Mesa Lake and, and hike a, a mile into South Mesa Lake, which has brook trout mostly in the you know, seven and the nine inch, maybe 10 inch category. You want to take in some waders because you'll notice there's a a shallow shelf over here. You can hike another mile and get up to Lost Lake and you can fish for some of the brook trout that get up to 18 inches up there. Are you going to catch them? Probably not because if you can see them, they can see you and they will go right down that water to Jim Clear. I've been skunked up there a couple of times, but it, you know, you'll go up there. You won't see a zillion fish. You'll see maybe three, if you're lucky, four. But there's really good Calabasas hatch up there as well as on most of the, the, the Grand Mesa. The, this is a map that shows you kind of the heart of uh, the Grand Mesa. And you can see these, these are our sections, 640 acres. So you can see a lot of these reservoirs are under, over 100 acres. And this is the largest one, Island Lake. The road goes right along this to all the way to Eccleston Lake here. Uh, Ward Lake or Deep Ward Lake, you can uh, uh, drive right up to that. Um, it has uh, mostly rainbow trout in there, I think some splake also. Um, I caught a nice 15 inch fish over there, so it obviously is big enough to get, get some really nice holdovers. Um, at the end of that, or towards the end of that road is Eggleston Lake. Um, Eggleston Lake has really good midge hatches in the evening. Every evening that I've passed by there, the fish have just been going crazy. 
and mostly stockable rainbow, but also cutthroat are are stocked in there. and you can also catch brown trout in there. i haven't caught any browns over you know twelve inches or so, but there's some nice fish in there and it's and it's a ah little bit of a change to catch some browns in the water you have to watch out for bear when you're up there you know they're gonna probably watch out for you and and so you don't i'm just telling you this so that you keep your food inside the car and and keep a clean camp site. i'd be more concerned about the moose and the willows up there and spooking one of those butts lake is not a butt buster to get in it's only one point seven miles to get into that and this has nice cutthroat trout in there um you can actually camp up there if you really wanted to there's two maybe three camp sites in there on the south shore you can get into bat cast over there the trees are far enough and you can watch the fish through the shore if you're more adventurous you can go over to the north shore you can see it's really steep and you could boulder hop along the talus and see the fish in and out of the of the boulders there and you can have some good brass pike fishing there and the fish get up to about fifteen inches unfortunately there are no regulations on the lakes you know catch and kill if people want to do that which is unfortunate but anyways there is silver lake and this does have regulations on and i you know since i released a fish i can't tell you if it's a catch and release or two fish over sixteen inches or or anything like that but the regulations mean there's going to be less people up there you'll get some people that drive in you can drive into this lake there is a quarter mile of semi-rough road but you know something like a subaru or anything you know can can get in there without any trouble at all if you want to fish that earlier in the year you know in june maybe you know before the fourth of july and fish it when there's a ripple on the water as as well there's some nice cutthroat in there the cutthroat get up to about fifteen inches most of them are are twelve to fourteen inches or so they're good calabetus hatch up there you can belly boat and there are also some grayling in the lake let's move on now to the ten mile and mosquito ranges so if you're up in summit county or park county you know vacationing you can take your fly rod up there it's named for ten unimaginative peaks peak one peak two peak three you get the you get the idea there some of them are occupied by their ski area called breckenridge as well so it's in the backyard of breckenridge and on the south end of fairplay has a rich mining history and and you know here we're going to test your high school or college chemistry in your periodic table of the elements but you know they uh they mine gold they mine silver there copper lead and zinc the highest trout fishing in north america highest trout fishing in North America, right in our backyard. Trout bearing lakes average 12,400 feet. This, this doesn't include the reservoirs, these are the natural lakes. And when you're retired like me, you can go in there and take every single lake and do a spreadsheet and put the elevation and play around with nets. That's how I came up with the 12,400 feet. As such, they're all high elevation lakes located in cirques. Some have dry, there are some dry up reservoirs that are mostly stocked with, with rainbows. Uh, some big cutthroats up there and an occasional brook trout as well. So one that you can drive to if you go from Copper Mountain up over Fremont Pass, you know, is Clinton Gulch Reservoir there. Um, Clinton Gulch Reservoir has cutthroat in there. I've, I've caught them up to about 16 inches. Unfortunately, this does not have any regulations for trout. So as a result, you're going to get a lot of people that are going to be drowning worms along there. And I've seen some trout up to about 18 inches on stringers up there. Uh, here was a nice 16-inch fish that I caught um, one Saturday uh, morning fishing for, for cutthroat up there. They, re they reproduce actually in the, in the inlet stream. The, the reservoir is not stocked, so it's susceptible to over harvest. But I caught two of these 16 inch fish and I, I didn't see anybody else fishing or catching any fish that particular morning. They were all bait fishing and I was fishing uh, drives at the time. And there was a guy about 50 feet over on my right, a guy 50 feet over on my left. They weren't crowding me at all. I mean, we had ample room. They were dunking worms. And 
and saw me catch two fish, and when they saw me release this fish, it was like I committed the sacrilege or something. <laughs> Rich mining history up there. Um, some of the lakes are impacted by the mining. This is all over Twist Lake. You can see the tailings here. They're leaching into the lake. There, there are small cutthroats in here, though. You can see them coming up here. I went to fish for them. I'd continue on on the trail and go to Cooney Lake up there, where I caught an awful lot of 10 and 12 inch, you know, cutthroat there. Of course, uh, my friend told me he said, Is that all? It's a 12 inch fish? I caught 16 inch fish when I was up there. Yeah, right. <laughs> Montgomery Reservoir, you can drive right up to it, stocked with catchable rainbows and cutthroat. You know, some of the areas there, I think, are closed to fishing, others are open along shore. You have to look at the regs. It has some huge rainbow trout. Incredible that you can catch from shore with 10 foot casts. And I see people just shaking their head on that. You know, this is this is one thing when you when you do this on Zoom, you really can't read the audience, but in person you can. And you can just hear the bullshit coming. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, this is an Alaskan steelhead. I just troop it in there to make sure that, that everybody's awake, you know. This, this was my largest trout. That guy was 36 inches. Well, you will catch rainbows in, in there, but I, I don't fish the reservoir, really. I go up and, and hike up the inlet uh, stream over there. There's a faint trail there that will take you up to the Wheeler Lakes. It's the three miles, but it's a real steep hike to get up there. There's the lower Wheeler Lake, and then there's the upper Wheeler Lake as well. Now, the upper Wheeler Lake has a bigger cutthroat in there, and the lower lake has cutthroat and brook trout in there, but not quite as big as the upper now, if you, you uh, go through the town of Blue River off of Highway 9 there, there's a string of Mohawk lakes up there, Mohawk Lake 1 through 5. Uh, steep hike to get up there. Uh, the first lake is really too shallow to hold trout on a, on a permanent basis. You get up to this Mohawk Lake number 2, and you'll catch uh, a cutthroat there up to about 14 inches. This whole drain is just cutthroat trout. There's uh, one of the fish there, about a 12, 13 inch fish. Uh, the second Mohawk Lake is also kind of shallow, so bypass that one. The fourth Mohawk Lake has cuts up to, up to about, about 12, 13 inches. My favorite is the Mohawk Lake number five. Um, you can see it has a shallow shelf, but it has cuts in there up to about 16 inches or so. I caught some nice, really fat, really big caddis flies in, the, in September. Okay, let's move on here to the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness. Uh, this area is 181,000 forested acres in the Elk Mountains west of Aspen, and the geology there is dominated by a folded and faulted maroon formation. It, it kind of looks like around Red Rock Red Island, around Boulder, except the, uh, the, the rock is a little darker. Home to 17 fourteeners, including three of the five most sightly in Colorado, uh, which includes Capitol Peak, um, I think Snowmass, and North Maroon. I, I was involved in a rescue once off of uh, Capitol Peak there when I was fishing the lake and had to flag down a reconnaissance uh, plane and somebody tried to take a shortcut off of uh, Capitol Peak. There are no shortcuts coming off of 14ers, by the way. If, if there was a shortcut, that would be the trail. <laughs> Mostly middle to high elevation lakes requiring medium to long hikes, except for Maroon Lake that you can uh, just about drive up to. Again, you need a, a permit to get in there. You gotta get a permit to get on the bus that takes you up there, and you gotta get a parking permit at Snowmass. Or you can get up there before eight o'clock and kind of bypass that stuff. And these regulations change on year to year, so you know, get on the website there for the, for the White River Forest there and, and check that out if you're going up. Um, everybody really, really wants a shot like that. You've seen, you know, photographs like that in the, in the fall. What they like to do is get, you know, the nice aspen there. What I'm gonna do with this photo is you could go and like them and color that up and mail it to me. <laughs> so I tried to get my uh, Grand Slam up there. I caught a brook eel rainbow and cutthroat. 
none of these would really fit. They topped out at about, about 12 inches or so. But I know that they had stocked brown trout like decades ago, and I was hoping some of them would survive in the stream. But I was unable to get my brown, so I'm going to get it right now to get my grand slam. Uh, if you go up the trail, you can pass Crater Lake. Um, it is stocked with cutthroat. I fished it really intensely and did not catch anything. And it has a history of winter killing. I could see the bottom. It's a pretty shallow lake, and there are no fish there when I fished, even though it had been stocked, you know, several several years in succession before that. If you want to continue up the pass again to a fork, take that fork. So if you take the left one, you go over Buckskin Pass and then back down. Uh, to Willow Lake. This is not a day hike. This is a backpack trip, really. Uh, six and a half miles climbing up to almost 13,000 feet or so. But it has nice brook trout in there up to about 14 inches. Shallow shelf, so you want to take some waders. A lot of midges. You'll have be having to make 40 and 50 foot casts in order to reach them. However, you can go on the other fork to Snowmass Lake, and we figured, you know, eight miles in, we were going to catch huge cutthroat in but well, we caught mostly brook trout up to 12 inches and a few cutthroat as well. So we were a little disappointed there, but we had a nice view of Snowmass Mountain here, which is a 14 inch. Um, American Lake, is, which is off the, the Castle Road out of, you know, south of Aspen over there, it's only a three mile hike, it's really steep, and it's only about a four acre lake, but there are some oversized cutthroat in there. Also along Castle Creek is Cathedral Lake, uh, again, a short but steep hike at Timberline, there with uh, cuts up to about 16 inches. There's one really nice fat one. And I did not stretch that one out lightly. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the last area over here uh, briefly. We're going to do the Wemenuchi Wilderness, and we're only going to talk about the western half of it. It's located in the South San Juan Mountains or in the San Juan Mountains, rather, and contains some of the most remote high lakes above Timberline in the state. It has unparalleled beauty. The mountains are really sharp and jagged there, uh, well known for the Durango and Silverton train. It's long-standing mining history, and we're not going to test your knowledge on that periodic table here. Uh, surprisingly, it has some dry-up lakes as well that are pretty good fishing. But it's wickedly wet, and it's a highly electric moisture area that hits the San Grid Cristos in New Mexico then it comes up and it, and it hits the uh, San Juan, South San Juan and San Juan in Colorado. So make sure you take a nice tent because you're probably going to have some tent time during the afternoon. And then, like I said, it's really highly electric. Highly electric. There's the Durango to Silverton train. It runs along the Animas River. And a lot of backpackers get off at Needleton. Why do they get off? Because they do the 14ers in there. So you have a lot of people over there. Um, the, the lakes you really want to fish in there are Columbine and, and Hazel Lake. You know, you'll hike to Needleton up to about 12,000 feet to get to these lakes. If you want to fish the other lakes in the area, you got to drop all the way down to 9,500 feet and then crawl all the way back up if you want to fish things like Sunshine and Leviton Lakes, and they're really nasty places to get into. I have not been into any of those lakes, mainly because of the logistics of getting in there. Um, however, you can drive right by Molden Lake over there, and look at the Grenadiers in the background over there. Um, this is a day-use area, and uh, last, last time I was in there, the city of Silverton that manages it didn't even charge you a fee. There is a campground there, Unfortunately, they rent paddle boards in there as well. I don't know how many people paddle board when, when I was fishing there, nobody was. And you can either drown the worm, you know, from shore there, or you can go out the belly boat. I fly fished from shore and was quite successful in catching mostly rainbows and some cutbows and some Snake River rainbow hybrids as well. And they were up to about 14 inches with a good damper fly edge there. A little Mullis Lake, a little bit down the road, about Forest Service campgrounds and pure strain Colorado River cutthroat in there, and you can get away from uh, some people over there. You can also go up South Mineral Creek to the Ice Lake Basin. Um, 
Cal Mineral Creek has uh, quite a few boats. I wouldn't suggest fishing it mainly because it has a lot of mineralization and it just has a small population of stunted brook trout. But go up and fish up, uh, go up the Ice Lake Basin. I don't want to hear anybody complaining about the hike because this woman was 80 years old when she made it up there. It's a three and a half mile hike up there. It, it, it does get a lot of traffic. During the week on weekends, it's very popular up there. This lake, you can see the aqua color. I first fished this lake probably in 1984, and I caught a little brook trout on every other cast. I don't think I caught a fish over seven inches. I went up there about, I don't know, about six years ago and fished. And fished it really hard and did not catch anything. There were three men that were camped up at the lake and they fished it solid for three days and didn't catch anything. I learned the reason. I went to the inlet and there was some mine drainage coming in from one of the mines up there and there was white precipitate on all the rocks, which I assume was aluminum, which is toxic to fish. And zinc is very toxic as well. But what you want to do is take your picture and then go to the left and go up to Fuller Lake, which is, has uh, some nice cutthroat in there mostly in the 10 to 14 inch range. Or you can take the trail to the right and go to Island Lake. Also has some nice uh, beautiful blue water, but also has a nice cutthroat in there. Mostly in the 9 to 11 inches, but really colorful fish. Um, if you don't want to hike in the Ice Lake Basin, you continue on that road and go up and you'll go down into Hope Lake. Hope Lake has a population of cutthroat in there. You can also reach it from the Telluride side. This is where you want to fish along this area. There are cutthroat in there, uh, mostly from 12 to 15 inches. And then uh, one of the last places I'll talk about is the Los Pinos River. Um, the Zalacitos Reservoir at Durango. You want to go to the end of Zalacitos Reservoir, the upstream end. There you can hike from 3 to 12 miles to get in there and fish. Uh, you will catch mostly uh, rainbow and cutthroat in the lower end, uh, brown trout in the upper end, and, and I did not get my grand slam, and you know what happens there. Those are the kind of really wishing for luck. <laughs> uh, the Emerald Lakes, 11 miles in, obviously backpack stripping there. Little Emerald, and then the 275-acre Emerald Lake, which I think is the third largest in the state, has nice 15-inch cutthroat in there, and they reproduce in the uh, streams between the two lakes. So let me leave you just with a few thoughts on there, on here when you fish the high country. Please practice catching and release. We, we, these are fragile resources. If you must kill a fish, if you injured it, or you just have to have one of those little broken for, for, for dinner, uh, clean the fish and bury the entrails far away from the lakes and streams. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've gone up to the lake and looked at entrails. I don't know why people do that. I mean, it's not like they're going to readily decay in the water. They're going to sit there for over a month. Pack out your trash and we all know that. Camp at least 100 feet from the water. And I, I think we can forego campfires at this point in the backcountry. I mean, they have really good backpack stoves. I, don't, I haven't had a, back, a campfire in the backcountry in probably 25 years plus. You know, campfires are great in the, in the desert. Too much of a risk for wildfire. Watch the weather. We all know that. It can change on a dime. So just take adequate clothing and rain gear. And know your limits. Some of these places, uh, 10 years ago, I could have gone into a day. I now have to break up into two days max to get in there. And leave only footprints and maybe a few soy legs. <laughs> so at that, um, remember I've got some books up here. And there are also, there's a lot more information on fishing high lakes, backcountry streams, and stuff on my so at this point, I can entertain any questions if we have time. Thank you, Ron. Any questions for Ron? No. Well, you go up into uh, the high country lake for a day. But do you take waders too? And that, that helps you out a little bit? You know, I will take waders if I'm going up to a lake that I know that has a shallow shelf. But a lot of times the lakes here in the front range, they, they have steep drop-offs here and there along the lake, so, and that's where the fish usually hang out anyway. Any 
Anybody else? Is this a favorite one? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Pardon me? Gorge? Do you know Gorge? Yes. <laughs> you know, I really like Trapper's Lake because you do get to, you know, you can 300 yards, you know, don't park your car in the opposite parking lot because of the marlin. They'll chew your wiring and stuff. So I, I know that. I had $300 worth of damage. And, and my friend told me, well, that was because you had a Toyota. You know, they're not going to do the, they're not going to chew on the Ford. Fishing was so good, we went up the next week and we went and he scored 150. And he has a thousand dollars worth of thank you. Yeah, one more. Do you use uh, the stock in your boats in the same? I do. And uh, for just about every lake. some lakes that I've fished a number of times that I don't, I don't need the stocking statistics, but uh, to put the book together, yeah, I did. And, and uh, all of these 23 chapters were originally articles in Colorado Outdoors, and so the first thing that I did, you know, the, the winter before that season, the field season, I got all the stocking data, and then I find, you know, to expect what to expect. Um, some of these areas I went into 20 years ago, so then recent stocking data uh, in there. And I also use creel surveys when they're, when they're available uh, to supplement the, the data and, and talk to the biologists as well. A lot of the biologists don't fish these lakes. They can't. You know, there's, there, there, there's one woman in, uh, I, I think she's in Brunswick Springs, and she had like 200 high lakes or something in her area. I mean, she can't possibly get to those things. Not, not over the rest of her life to, to do uh, sample work. Any other Thank questions? you very much. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> we have a small gift, uh, just a token of our appreciation. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Oh, that's a really nice one. Well, thank you all for coming. Next month we're going to have a movie night, so it'll be a combination of uh, some conservation, fishing tips, and fish porn. So. I hope you can make that. Thanks again. Bye-bye.